Thank you for watching the World Community Magazine's Hour of Power Live on Facebook with your hosts Edward McQueen and April Garner.
Or you mute it, Brother Edward. Brother Edward, you mute it. Not, not anymore. There you go. All right. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I guess I'm so excited, you know, I must have accidentally, accidentally muted myself because we, we expect some good things today. We want to hear some, want to hear some good things. And, uh, uh, and, and all of you out there who, um, first of all, good evening. I'm Ed McQueen, your, your host. And of course, Sister April Garner is our co-host. And um, mm -hmm. we just want to, you, to share with you all this evening uh, some wonderful information regarding genealogy and uh, I'm, I'm just going to start off by saying that I'm excited about it because um, I'm going to probably going to find out some things uh, if we deep, look deep enough uh, you either want to know about or you don't want to know, <laughs> don't want to know about but anyway um, we're, we're going to get some information on how to go about doing these things and how um, and how it can best serve us so April um, I, I think uh, it is it appropriate that you kind of kick us off with things okay uh, all, right. all right yeah so first of all thank you all for joining us as brother edward said and uh, we certainly do have a wonderful topic tonight african-american genealogy discover the roots of your existence and we have a very special guest tonight who is uh joining us as i would say one of the experts on uh, how to trace your family roots because when I met her, uh, she certainly enlightened me on some things. And in my mind, she's definitely an expert on what she's talking about. And even her bio lets us know that basically she has been able to document her family history back to 1720 and has conducted her family research for Ooh. the past 25 years. So uh, she is a genealogist, an African-American genealogist. She has a podcast, Speak On It, History and Genealogy. And it's just wonderful to know this person who has come into my life as a brand new family member. And we're going to tell you how. So welcome tonight, Miss Janice she, she may, Gilliard. She may, she, or April, she may be everybody's family member. She may be her family member. Oh, <laughs> say that. April, you never know. <laughs> thank you so, so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Yes, yes, Look yes. We are definitely happy to have you. And we want to remind our viewers, if you have any questions or comments, please post them in the chat and we'll be sure to share them with our special guests. Uh, you might want to get out your pad and pen. I'm ready right. oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, to take notes. And uh, you may discover some things that are going to be aha moments and, and uh, discover some pointers that may help you start your search as you try to trace your family roots. And I know this is a big topic for a lot of people and it's so appropriate for Black History Month. And so uh, before we get into it, I definitely want Janice to introduce herself and then we can tell them a little story about how we became connected. So Janice, why don't you do that for our audience? Okay, April and Everett again, thank you so much. I am humbled and honored um, to be here with you. And just want to say with April, uh, she had made a comment on a post by Damon Fordham. And a lot of people know him as a historian, um, he does a little family history, but he is amazing when it comes to black history and history in general, especially in Charleston. And so April responded to a comment and then I responded and then we just started this exchange. And then we talked a little bit about where she's from in South Carolina and her family. And I'm, I, you know, I'm going, wait a minute that I, I have some of the same family as far as the area location. And one of the names that came up was Chestnut. It was like, okay, well, wait a minute. And she spoke about Mariah. I'm going, well, I have a Mariah. So I looked at my family tree. We kept talking. And as it turned out, we share one of the same ancestors, Mariah Chestnut. And also um, there were various surnames that we covered. So Vereen, um, Parkers. And I was just amazed at how this all unfolded, basically, from responding to a Facebook post. So mm -hmm. I've met family and conferences um, occasionally on Facebook. It's not a lot. So that really blew me away. And then April and I ended up having a conversation. We just clicked like instantly. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we're family. So <laughs> anyway, but that was truly, truly a blessing. And you just never know where you're going to find family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Janice, uh, let everyone know uh, where you're from. You're currently in New Jersey. Is that correct? I'm in New Jersey, but mm -hmm. I am originally from a very, very small town in South Carolina. It's called Mullen, South Carolina. Of in course. Jersey. Marion County. Yes. And, uh, I've been in New Jersey. Let's see. We moved here when I was 13 years old. So I've been here for a long time. Um, I've been researching my family history for about 25, close to 25, 26 years. And it all started with a challenge. 
And so basically my husband was doing his family research. And honestly, I found it so annoying. Like when he talked to one person, one line, I was okay with that. But then it just turned into all these different lines. He was always on the phone. And I'm just like, what are you doing now? Mind you, I've always loved history, but I never did anything with family history. And so because I was just so annoyed, one day he just looked at me and said, well, you should do it. And I responded, I know my family, I know them. And so who are your parents? Very, very easy response. Who are your grandparents? Okay, well, easy. Who are your great grandparents? Mm -hmm. I tell you, it was like somebody scratching the wall or like something was stuck in my throat. I honestly could not believe I didn't and that I had never even really thought about it. And I said, okay, so I'm going to start. So we talked a little bit about what he was doing. And I called an aunt in South Carolina. No, before I could call her, she has a nickname. And you all know about the South Carolina nicknames. And so her nickname was Sook. So I called my mom and I said, well, wait a minute, what's her real name? I hadn't talked to the family in a long time. And back in the day, you know, you could go to the phone book or call the operator and get a telephone number. Yes. So my mother said, her name is Ruby. My response was, well, where in the world does Sook come from? And she said, well, everybody has nicknames down in South Carolina. I'm like, okay. So I called my aunt. We had a long conversation and I was a little frustrated that when I said, well, okay, who are your grandparents? You know, of course I knew my grandparents. And she, you know, she was really, really helpful. But she's like, well, I think they had nine kids. I think they had 10 kids. Mm. And then she would say, well, speak to this person. And this, it was the same thing over and over again. And I was stunned by the fact that nobody could give me like any concrete information. And so April and Edward, it's really interesting because on both sides of my family's maternal, paternal line, no one was doing any research. So then there was just like this burning desire that came out of nowhere to do it. I really believe I'm a person of faith, but I also believe that, you know, I believe that our ancestors want us to research and document as I've been sharing, research, document, share and preserve their stories. So through this journey, um, I was able to get the name of my great grandfather. And then it was like, OK, and it was old, very old fashioned when I started. So Ancestry.com was nothing like it is today mm. had to wait for them to load the census records for each state. And so we did it with by going to archives. You know, we started by traveling, a lot of traveling, going around and talking to various different, you know, various um, family members because you didn't have Facebook. It was either phone or traveling or one person saying, well, call this person, call that person. And so that's where it came from. It came from not being interested to, well, wait a minute, I don't know and I should know. And we had small children. So then it became, well, I want them to know. So when I say I started from scratch with genealogy, I started from scratch and there are times I laugh and I wonder if my husband's like, oh my gosh, what did I get her into? Because my whole world has changed. Someone made a comment recently and they said, when you start this work with genealogy, it will bless your life. And I'm going to tell you, it has blessed my life. April, you asked me to introduce myself, right? So in the beginning, when I started, I was just doing the research and then I joined a genealogy group became vice president of that group. I served for three years and now I'm on my second term serving as president. I'm on the board for um, NGS, the second black woman in history to serve and mm -hmm. it stands for the National Genealogical Society. I'm on several boards and in my spare time, my, my three children are um, young adults now. So all of my free time, all of it. Right. Genealogy, doing presentations, helping people. I'm so passionate about it because in our community, there are a lot of, there are more people doing it, but there are a lot of people that tell me, they constantly say, oh, nobody in my family is doing it, or they think that it's impossible to do. So that's the reason that I'm on a mission just to say, listen, don't let anyone, any researcher, anyone say, oh, well, they don't have records on African-Americans. There's not that much. That's not true. If I can get back to 1720, that lets you know that the information is there. And we'll get to, I'm sure, with your questions, you know, how you can do it. But as you can tell, very, very passionate about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so one ancestor leads to another ancestor to another ancestor. And I found some very um, interesting, um, exciting facts about family members. And I would go to, to about my answers and I would go and say, well, you know, did you know about this person? Or did you know that they founded a university? Did you know that... Um, they were professors and a lot of them didn't know. One story that I love to um, share is one about a, a cousin who uh, he recently retired from Shaw University. Well, one night while researching, I discovered that we had two ancestors that 
were professors at Shaw University, Edward McKnight Brawley and Benjamin Brawley, a father and a son. So when I found that information, I put it all together. I emailed it to my cousin. I said, you're never going to drive to work the same. I sent him the information. He was up all night looking at that information. Now, here's the kicker. He goes to work the next morning to tell his colleagues about it. He's sitting there waiting for one to come out of a meeting. He looks up at the bulletin board, and there's a mother and a daughter who currently teach at the university and a father and son who in the past taught at the university. The father and the son were the same people that I sent him the information on. Wow. And transformed his whole world. And, you know, I always speak about our young people. I feel that in our communities, if our young people knew their family history, mm -hmm. things would be totally different. And the reason that I say that, and I stress that is, I know for me, if I knew back then what I know now, my whole outlook and perspective and how I live my life, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a decent human being, but I'm telling you, I think it would, have, it would have just been a totally different outcome for me. Mm -hmm. Much better, not taking a long time to figure things out because my family, they were about community. They were about being educated and they were about making a difference and taking a stand. And I wonder, you know, sometimes I go, oh, that's where I get it from. Hmm. I have a slave narrative. It's for mom, Eugenia Woodbury. In that slave narrative, she talks about her daily life. From that slave narrative, she's quoted in over 200, over 200 publications. If you Google her, all of these different papers and publications will come up. Recently, because I shared her story, one of my colleagues was at the museum, the African, the new Smithsonian African American Museum in Washington, DC. She's walking through the slave exhibit and they have an excerpt from my second great grandmother's slave narrative. And so she said she gasped. Now the same weekend that she was there, I was there, but I had to, I had to leave. I had somebody with me. We were there for a big presentation. We were tired. And so I said to her, I said, if I had been at that museum and seen that it would have been 911 or security because I, it would have been so emotional for me. So that's the other thing is that this work is very spiritual. It's very moving. Now you have some people, they do it and they don't have that experience. But for me, it's transformative. Mm -hmm. it's, there are times that it's very, very sad when I read certain things or what they went through. But then on another note, it empowers me and it lets me know, listen, you're here because they were resilient. They survived. And if they could go through that, there's nothing that you can't handle. And that's how I live my life now. Another thing with that slave narrative, um, mom, Eugenia Woodbury, she knew how to cultivate indigo. I mm. love the color indigo. So DNA is in me, right? And then in her narrative, it said that she made yarn. Well, guess who is an, a yarn addict? DM. Wow. So if you ever wonder, you know, about the power of DNA, it's real. My mother said to me about my son, my, she was telling me about my father. And she said, oh, well, your father could take a car apart and, you know, put it together without a book, nothing, right? My son was like that as a kid, very creative. They're always doing things. That, he is an aerospace engineer now. So they're not, our ancestors are our ancestors, but they are, that DNA is it, strong. It's mm -hmm. in us. Mm -hmm. It speaks when we travel, when we go certain places and we feel like, wait a minute, I've been here before. And then you do the research and find out that your ancestors came from that area. So it speaks to us and it cries out for us to research, document, share, preserve, and then teach when we have family reunions. And I said this at a presentation this past weekend. I said, you know, they can put music on. Everybody can get together and do every line dance. And we just know what to do, right? And then we eat and we have fun. But at our family reunions, you can do all of that. But we're going to do the family introductions. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I put, I bring poster boards. And you're going to know who your family, who your ancestors were. For all of the children, I tell them, when you're in history class, right, pay attention. Because as they're sharing that history, it's your history. I always loved history as a child, right? But then when I started doing genealogy, and I was like, wait a minute, 
my second great grandfather was 17 years old when Abraham Lincoln was president. It takes on a whole new meaning, right? Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, I would say this, if our children can learn, and I'm not putting anyone down, right? But if they can learn rap songs, if they can get out and do dances like that, then they can learn their history and it can make a difference in their lives. Mm -hmm. Things can change. Things can change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what you're saying is so profound because, uh, you know, we're at a day and time when there's so much discussion around history and, and the things that we don't know about our history, the things that people are trying to uh, prohibit in terms of what's being taught about our history. And so, uh, you know, what we do know about tracing your family roots and genealogy is that, uh, you know, knowing your genealogy can actually help to correct some historical yes. narratives. And so, you know, that, yeah. that's an important thing. And, you know, in our pre show discussions, the conversation that we had after you and I connected, you know, one of the things that came up is the fact that discovery is endless. And that's a phrase that yeah, you and I yeah, are, are connected to now. Discovery is endless. And so, you know, Janice, as you were discovering, you know, these little morsels and tidbits about your history, you know, how did it make you feel in terms of uh, understanding more about just your family makeup in general. You know, some people will learn uh, things about their history and they say, okay, well, that's great to know. Uh, and you've said it a little bit that, you know, it will change you. But I think when you know w where you came from in a historical context and you understand what you're really connected to in terms of um, not only just local history, but world history. There's one story I, I want you to kind of touch on when you talk about the Civil War discovery that you have in your family, you know, and that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. It's huge because, you know, the things that we hear about, even, you know, things that, uh, you know, happen within this country, uh, some of the historical context is so far removed from it, the inclusion of, of black people in the narrative. So we really need to understand how we are really uh, interwoven into the fabric of not only our local history, our state history, our national history, but world history. Uh, so yeah, you know, what, what was your feeling with your first discovery? Okay, so when I learned about the Civil War, the whole Reconstruction era, right? I'm sitting there in class. I can remember this was just as clear as day thinking, this has absolutely nothing to do with me or my family. So during my research, when I discovered my first ancestor that fought in the Civil War, I'm going, what? And then recently to get the Civil War pension file for one of my ancestors, where my family kept saying that one of my, that my great grandfather on my dad's side was Native American. I'm like, oh, you know, sorry, I'm not finding that. And then to open to be at the National Archives and tears started running down my face. And the lady was like, are you okay? I was like, yes, just need a moment. And I'm not going to cry all over your documents. Mm -hmm. But to open his Civil War pension file and to see them describe him as a red Indian mm. from Rhode Island. And Connecticut, you know, his, his father was from Rhode Island and Connecticut thinking, oh, wait a minute. Well, I just thought we were only from South Carolina. For years, that's what I said and what I thought. Not true. Um, it was a range of emotions. One was anger that you're being taught history and no teacher ever said to me or explained like, hey, this is your history too. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, that's, a, that's a disservice to teach children history and not maybe even do like um, a family history project or, or, or let them know, hey, talk to your family members, talk to your grandparents, talk to your great grandparents, see what document. No one ever said that to me, explained that to me. So at first, it was a little bit of anger and feeling like a disservice was done. Right. So then it became empowering. Wow. They fought like um, my one ancestor. I was reading a document in his folder and he talked about having carbuncles from walking, from walking so much. And he talked about from one location to the next. And then his brother also served in the civil war and to see that he wrote his wife letters Mm. And that those letters are, some of them are held at um, University of Virginia. Some of them are at the Connecticut Historical Society. And he had one uh, friend of his where his wife never wrote him back. There was never an exchange. So he would talk to my second great grandfather or second great grand uncle and say, well, can you tell my wife to write me and tell her this and tell her that to see that they talked about all of the battles that they fought in. That makes a huge difference 
when it comes down to history and then to love history, but still think that you're disconnected from it and it has nothing to do with you. So again, on our Facebook family page, we have about 300 uh, members on this one line. I Every now and then I go in and remind them, tell your children to pay attention in history class. You know, I have one ancestor that is listed on the 1776 military census out of Rhode Island. So what does that mean? He may have fought in the American Revolutionary War. What is Rhode Island's history? They didn't have enough white people to fight in the battle. So they were like, all right, we'll take the Native people, the Native Americans, and then we'll take the Black people. All right, we'll settle. Well, he's on that census record for um, the um, military census for a reason. And if you were short, more than likely, he fought. And you know what? I'm not finding a lot of records for that to go any further. And so you know what I'm thinking? He fought in the place of his enslaver. Mm. quite a bit mm. so, so history i just remind people history is not boring a lot of people feel like well i don't think i can get past 1870 i'm here to blow that completely out of the water ancestry.com and family search they have done an amazing job of putting the wills online so you do your research you look at the people that lived in the community right and you go and start looking at wills and you'll see your ancestors listed in the wills. I just did that recently with one ancestor on Ancestry.com. Somebody actually listed a will. And I was like, wow, the Baker family. I remember that when one of my ancestors died, they put his death in a newspaper. He was black. If they, a lot of people lived to be over 100 years old, they would put their deaths in the newspaper. And then they said he was enslaved by the Baker family. And I had seen the mm. Bakers as neighbors, found the name of the enslaver, read about the enslaver. I tell people all the time, when you're researching your family history, research potential enslavers, or if you know them, research their family just as much. And then you're going to get the historical context and narrative of what your ancestors went through. Now, April, some of our ancestors... They were on a plantation in North Carolina when George Washington came through on his Southern tour. They were on a plantation in the Myrtle Beach area when he came through his Southern tour. You tell me that doesn't make a difference. You tell me you can't imagine, oh, my ancestors on the plantation and the president of the United States is coming through. And this is supposed mm -hmm. to be a free country, but I'm enslaved. Mm -hmm. So you made a really good point. You said correcting the historical narrative. No, it wasn't just George Washington and you know his friends or colleagues, and we weren't around. No, we were on the plantation, probably cooking, probably cleaning, probably not probably, and serving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. correcting that historical narrative. When I do presentations, I put the historical markers. They have them right there in South Carolina. When he came to the Myrtle Beach area, they have it in North Carolina. I slap them right in my presentations and note that my ancestors were on the plantation when he came through. Mm. Mm, 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 so I, you know, I don't know the words to this song, but there's a theme song that um, I think it's Deion Sanders. Give me my theme music. That's how <laughs> I feel about my ancestors when I find them, that they're going, that's right. Give me my theme music. Dun-dun-dun. <laughs> <laughs> Right. They tell their stories. But, and so they want, they want that, to be found in the historical record. And then when you find them and you start putting together the narrative for their lives, everything right. takes on a whole different meaning when it comes to history. And you're like, now, wait a minute. And if you read the slave narrative for Eugenia Woodbury, she's talking about nursing the master's children, which is what's highlighted at the museum. She's talking about her grandmother, which takes me back another generation. Now, this is my second grandmother talking about her grandmother in the slave narrative. She's talking about being upset that they moved to church that is still in uh, the Mary and Britain's Neck, South Carolina, moving to church and that they shouldn't have moved their church, right? She's talking about her wedding mm. and how beautiful. Now, that made me cry because I've never heard of somebody talking about their wedding and jumping the broom and that they made tea cakes and then she talks about what her dress was made of muslin mm -hmm. muslin i didn't i some people know what it knew what it was i didn't so i looked it up to understand it and just say wait a minute she had a moment of being happy she had a moment of being happy and then to reflect on the interviews with my grandmother who lived to be 97 98 years old and remembering years ago i said well do you remember your grandparents yes jenny and henry woodbury well her name they called her jenny her name was, she's referred to as Eugenia, E-U-G-E-N-I, Mom Jenia, 
G-E-N-I-A and Jenny, J-E-N-N-Y. Hmm. And she paints a picture. So I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard of the book, the, A Pound for Their Flesh, and then They Were Her Property. Both of those authors put snippets of my grandma, my second great grandmother's slave narrative in their book. A lot of people do their papers and include her narrative in their paper. So she's speaking and mm -hmm. I'm sitting here going, oh my goodness. And I'll just share this one before we move on. Um, I was talking to my aunt, getting some information, like all of a sudden she wants to start sharing all this information. I said, I've been doing this for 20 years and you never shared this with me. So I decided to bring up Ancestry.com and I look and I put some of the names in and then it goes all the way back to a woman named Willoughby McWhite. And somebody put a note and said, if you're connected to this person, check out the PBS History Detectives segment on her. They did a segment on her life. What? I go and I put it in Google and a transcript script comes up and I just start crying. And I'm like, okay, I got to get the video. I got to get the video. I'm sure PBS, it's got to exist. The video exists. And it was a 15 minute, 14, 15 minute segment about her life. And what that, the way it started was there was a woman in Kansas going through her grandfather's Civil War memorabilia, gets to the end of the box and sees a slave bill of sale for Willoughby for $325. So that's why I was crying. And this was on the 4th of July, my grandmother's 97th birthday. I found that at four o'clock in the afternoon, I was up until five o'clock the next morning, processing that, mm -hmm. crying, and then looking at, oh, well, she was Victoria. So she was sold in Charleston, South Carolina, $325 at 17 years of age, taken from Charleston to Marion. And then after slavery, she was able to purchase, she and her husband, 160 acres of the land that she was enslaved on. And then finding that the Daughters of the American Revolution, a couple of years back, they did a ceremony and they included her and honored her. And then in doing further research, seeing who her enslaver was and looking up his will and seeing that he was like, okay, well, if anything happens to me, make sure that she goes to this particular person. But then there are five other slaves that are listed and it's like, yeah, we'll sell them. So it's kind of looking out for her. And I wondered why I'm sure I'll find that out eventually. So Again, going back to the point of, oh, well, records don't exist. Well, the slave bill of sale exists. Mm. And I was on a mission to find the woman who sent that in and thank her. Now, listen to this. This is really crazy, right? Could not find anything on her. Every, every, every lead that I thought I had was a dead end, right? So somebody goes on to a Facebook group that I belong to. I had written about the story. Somebody had published the story. And this particular person all the way out in California says, oh, well, let me go on Robin Foster's Facebook page and see what she's got going on. My story is highlighted. The woman contacts me and says, how about the person that submitted that inquiry is my friend of 20 years and I can put you in touch, in touch with her. Wow. Wow. So I was able to thank her for that because I would have never found it. Mm -hmm. And if someone hadn't put that note in, I thank the gentleman who put the note in Facebook. So you have to network, you have to interview your family members, you have to research. And no research is not like finding your roots to television show where you can figure it out in 30 minutes. It is work, but it is worth it. It's worth it to take your time. It's worth it to go and talk to the older relatives now before it's too late. Right. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. when they're gone, they take so much with, with them. them. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. That and is then right. You're just scratching around trying to figure things out. But thank God for my grandmother that she remembered. Thank God for my older cousins that were able to tell me so much. And then don't poo poo when people say, oh, our family's Native American. Don't say, well, everybody says that. You know what? Either prove it or disprove it. Correct. In my right. case, I was able to prove it. And April, actually, on this line, because you're connected to me on my maternal line, there's Native ancestry on the maternal line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's worth it. It is so worth it to take your time. You're going to use census records. You're going to use wills. You're going to use birth certificates and death certificates. And I'll say this. Ancestry, has they have made it a lot easier Basically, you can sit down. If you have your parents and your grandparents, you can create a really, really good tree in less than about an hour. But you still want to prove the information. Don't ever just you know take things on face at face value. I believe this is my my the way that I operate. If 
but have at least three pieces of evidence for any document or in any piece of information that you find. The other thing is don't be a tree hopper. Don't start your genealogy research and then you get these hints or it leads you to somebody else's tree and you start taking their information. And the reason that one of the main reasons why I stress that is, is if someone has incorrect information in their tree, Ancestry.com is not going to sit there and try to figure out if it's incorrect. And they're going to give you information based on that false information. Mm. So you want to operate when you're doing your family history. You want to take your time. You want to be methodical and you want to prove every person that you're adding to your tree. You want to prove it. And then you want to share it. Do not become. I've seen, I meet so many people that they're doing research. And they just feel like, well, this is mine. I put this. Yes, you put the work in and everything. But you know what? You don't own the ancestors. You don't. That's not work, what we're called to do. We live in a very individualistic society. And the same thing I see it over and over in genealogy. Now, let me say this. If you are writing, if you are taking pictures and you're putting all of this stuff together, no one has a right to just take all of your information and claim it as their own. I don't mm -hmm. believe in that. Mm -hmm. But if you have information that says, hey, you know, you were stuck here, I've got it, let's work together. It has to change, our world has to change where it's only just, oh, just us. It's mm -hmm. just, just my family. My, fam my grandmother in South Carolina, when my mother was coming up to New Jersey, my grandmother allowed us when she was going back and forth, like it, it, there was just a sense of community. And you always saw that. And then you always had a place to call home. And that's because of that. That's how I live my life now with my children. I let them know you can always come home. You can always come home. Now, we don't accept any and every, you know what I'm saying? You can't mm -hmm. do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. But where's that sense of community? I think it's it's changing, but it needs to change a lot. We have to care about each other more. We have to look out for each other more. And you might say, well, why would you say that? What does that have to do with genealogy? It has everything to do with genealogy because our ancestors did not go through everything that they went through mm -hmm. it, being so re resilient and surviving for us not to trust one another, not to build each other up. And one of my mottos is this. I believe this, right? If you're my sister, April, and you have, you're doing, you're doing the show and you're my brother, Edward, I'm going to cheer you on. I have a podcast. I don't, comp I don't compete. Mm -hmm. I, I believe in collaborating, mm -hmm. working with each other, and that has to happen. What's going on in Turkey? Who's to say that couldn't happen here? What are we That's doing? Correct. Here? That's correct. That's mm -hmm. correct. So we have to get back to that sense of just being human, humanity, mm -hmm. and looking out for one another. And then our history, I'm giving a talk on Sunday, right? And so the title of it is Legacy Matters, right? Our history matters. Our stories matter. Some of them may, I have some amazing stories. And then I have some stories. I'm like, what? He wasn't a professional alcohol salesman? Oh, you mean he was a moonshiner? You know, I have some of everything. Oh, he was a farmer? Oh, okay. All right. Oh, he was a professor? Oh, wait a minute. He helped find, he founded that HBCU? Oh, you mean my second great grandfather graduated with the first class and attended Howard University? Okay, so now even with that, let me, oh goodness. Okay, Howard University. My second great grandfather ended up in DC. I'm going, okay, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Virginia, North Carolina, I know. What were you doing mm -hmm. in Washington, DC? Mm -hmm. And you had a school in Washington, DC? Okay, well, this is not fitting in. When I opened up his Civil War pension file, after he fought in the Civil War, he ended up in Washington, D.C. That's where he's that's that was his last stop. And his whole thing was, I'm going to start a school. OK, I get it. It all made sense. So, you know, I tell people, start with yourself. Right. When you're doing genealogy, work with what you know and also work with what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And again, talking to your older relatives. And, you know, we say that a lot as genealogists. But also talk to the young people, include them in the work that you're doing. Oh, I'm doing this. Well, I'm not interested. Oh, no, you need to be interested mm -hmm, in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's important and it matters. It matters. And, the, and one of my main reasons for saying that, and listen, anybody can do genealogy. Okay, rah, 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 rah. But most families I know that don't look like, a, like us, they can tell you their family history. Because someone, at least one person or two people, been doing it in their family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For me not to know as an adult who my great grandparents, when I really started doing this work and I look at it now, I'm like, thank God my husband challenged me. 
because I was able to talk to the grandmothers and talk to the older cousins that could explain things to me. There was a lot that was missing, but what they provided for me laid an excellent foundation for me. Mm-hmm. So I'm just very, very passionate about someone. If, if no one else is doing it and you're the only person that's doing it, to me, it's like a calling. It's like an anointing. You're the one that's supposed to do it. Mm-hmm. And so now I ask the question, question, are you the one or is there another? Someone has to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Someone wow. has to do it. Wow. You know, yeah. with, with so much pa- passion that you're expressing, um, all, all of my questions probably come into one because <laughs> it's true to passion. But, but one stood out that, and that I wanted to know, well, well first of all, I, I thought it was so exciting uh, and, and I'm in awe that about letters. I mean, we could read and write during that time. I mean, that's that's amazing because they didn't want us to read and write. Okay. Well, listen, we're made to think that they all couldn't read or write. Okay, go ahead, Janice. Right? So when you look at those census records, right, in 1870 eight, and coming forward, 1870, 1880, they keep asking that question, right? right. Some of them could. Some of them could. My second great grandfather and his brother, my second great grandfather, there are about 80 documents in his Civil War pension file. For his brother, there are over 200 documents. So that day that I went and I'm scanning the information, the brother had so much information, I couldn't even get through it. They had to put like a little marker in there so that when I go back, I can finish scanning it. But it had every, it had. When I tell you, it just spelled out basically his entire life. I, I was just overwhelmed. So I'm definitely going back. And and listen, don't a lot of people are like, oh, you can go to the National Archives? Yes, but it's a little bit different. You have to take an orientation session online. It takes about 15, 20 minutes, and then you have to make an appointment. And then you want to do your research wherever you're going, whether it's the National Archives, whether it's uh, the arc, um, there's um, the research center in Columbia, South Carolina, no matter where you go or a local library, do your homework first, have your questions, and then check their website to see what's available so that when you walk in, you come in prepared. If you walk in and it's like, look, I I want some help, unless you just have someone who's overwhelmingly like merciful and kind, you can forget it. As soon as you turn your back, they're going to go to lunch or go on break or they're just going (laughs) to disappear. They go prepared. Go Mm -hmm. prepared. Know what you're looking for. So yes, they could read. Yes, they. I have um, my one line out of uh, Hartford, Connecticut. They were free people of color, and so they were. That particular line, as far as what I can see, they weren't enslaved. So their whole thing was, well, we're free, but we're not free until everybody is free. Harriet. Mm -hmm. Oh no, story of Amistad, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They were in. Now listen to this history, right? They were living in Connecticut. There's a church that still exists today. It was Talcott Congregational Church. They attended that church and they were in the courtroom fighting and backing the folks that were involved in Amistad. To read that, there was a newspaper. It was called the Charter Oaks newspaper. It was an anti-slavery newspaper. And they were, their whole thing, and then, you know, I'm saying to myself, they had to have some type of connections, but they had money and they fought. So, you know, people look at our history and it's like, oh, it was just like, no, we had some folks that were free and they were not afraid. They were fearless. And again, I look at my, I look at how passionate I am about things, right? And how I don't like to see anybody mistreated. So you can't do wrong. You can't do wrong to someone else in front of me. I And I said, well, maybe that's where I really get that passion from for just being, you know, being an advocate for people, right? Wanting to help people. I look at my family history and I go, that's me. I am them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And then, okay, so I had the moonshiner. So, you know, I'm like, well, I don't, you know, alcoholism runs in certain lines, you know, some of my family, it's there. So I stay away from that. So your family history, not only for health reasons, not only for history, you want to look at the patterns. And when you see things, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, generational curses. Some things can be broken. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Some patterns can be changed. You know, we are not destined to failure. There mm-hmm. are, all of us are not going to jail. There are people that are working to make a difference in communities all throughout the country. There are people like me talking about family history, talking about genealogy and saying, no, it's, it's not going down like that. My daughter is in her senior year at Syracuse University. The girl has a photographic memory. I'm sitting here going now, 
Well, does that come from some of those ancestors that were just brilliant educators? She knows how to play the violin, the piano. She taught herself how to play the guitar. She knows how to play the ukulele. And wow. she's musically inclined. At five years old, I bought her a Barbie piano, came downstairs. The girl was making beautiful music on this little pink Barbie piano. And I asked her, I said, how do you know how to do that? Where'd you get that from? I know, you know what I'm saying? I didn't, I love music, but I can't play Jack, right? Mm -hmm. So she said, I hear it in my head. I hear head. it. Yeah, she hears it. Mm -hmm. I hear it in my head. It's a gift. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Things that we're just so good at, all, it is a gift. It is a gift. And some of the stuff is, th there are things that are just in our DNA to do that comes from our ancestors. And when you study, when you study DNA, which I have done, right? It's power, it's energy, and it, it's in us. Why do we look like, you know, I, I talked about my second great grandfather fighting in the, um, the Civil War. Well, I have a picture of him, right? And so when I saw him, I was like, oh! the first time I saw the picture, you know why I did that? I have two brothers. And I'm going, they don't look like anybody in our family. As far back as all of the pictures, they just didn't look like anybody. When I saw the picture of my second great grandfather, it was so emotional for me because I was like, oh my God, it's they, they didn't get anything from their mother, nothing from the father. They got it all from my second great grandfather. They look exactly amazing. Right. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. This, uh, you know, uh, that, if you explored, uh, uh, I'm sure you probably know something about the Mormons, uh, their ability to archive things and, and, and uh, preserve um, Listen, ancestry stuff like that. I did Do make you? a note. So ancestry.com and family search. Um, there are other companies out there, but those are the two that I use the most, right? Right. And I've been to Utah. Utah. I went there for the first time back in January, um, and for the NGS board meeting. And when I tell you, I believe they actually have more records than Ancestry.com and the government. <laughs> wow. And the government. Yeah. So, and then they have a whole team of people that are willing to help you for free, whether you're there in person or whether you're there online. If you can't afford an Ancestry.com account, Family Search, it's FamilySearch.org. You can go on their website, you create an account, and all it is is your name and your email address, right? And they have the same records, census records and all. They have the same thing as Ancestry.com. Ancestry.com is really cool because you have a lot of folks that have their trees and you, know, you can connect with folks. Right. So if you're like, why well, I can't afford to pay for an account, I really don't want to do that right now, then go over to Family Search. But they are amazing. They have a conference every year. And if you attend virtually, it's free. And so that's Roots Tech. If you just type in Roots Tech 2023, it'll come up. Now, through um, networking, I presented for them twice, virtually. This year, coming up uh, March, um, the beginning of March, the first weekend in March, I'm actually going to be presenting in person for the first time. I've met some amazing people. So one thing I want to stress is I'm sure there are tons of people in South Carolina. Go on to the Facebook pages for genealogy in South Carolina. There's Robin Foster. There are a number of people where you can get the information. You can get help, a number of resources. You can put in Google how to start. Family Search has an excellent link if you're just starting and type in Family Search. Um, FamilySearch.org plus or Family Search plus African American Genealogy. So they have a wiki page that has so many great resources to get you started. And it's not difficult. It's not hard. You just have to take your time and work on one person at a time. And you can do it. You can do you, it. You, you, you know something, um, Janice? Um, I'm not throughout throughout your, your years. You said you've been doing like 26 years, right? Mm -hmm. It must be at least uh, in Graham, at least one that, that stood out that you've discovered that you, among all, among everything else, what was the most exciting one, that, one that, that, that stood out when, uh, upon your discovery? The one that stood out the most for me, I mean, it stayed the with one you. that I think about daily is Willoughby. And if you watch that segment on PBS, PBS she's 17 years old, and she is alone and she's being sold. And the reason that it stands out the most to me is that my husband and I were on vacation in South Carolina. This was about four years before I found out about her. And I said, I want to go to Charleston. He said, why? I said, I don't know. I just want to go to Charleston. 
And he was like, we have a property in South Carolina. So he's like, well, I have to go take care of this. I was like, okay. So I called to someone else and said, can you take me to Charleston? What do you want to go to Charleston for? I was like, I just have this thing that I want to go. So we get to Charleston. She's like, okay, fine. We get to Charleston. We walk around and they're like, oh, that's the slave mart. And it was just something that just burned in me. Like, this is why you were supposed to come, but I didn't know why. Right. So we're leaving. And I can talk about this now because I'm like, I'm just at a point now. I'm like, I don't care what people think. I know what I feel. I know what I believe. And I know what I sense. And I know the call and purpose to do this work. So I can say this. So when we were leaving, I turned around and you can see when you're leaving Charleston on that highway, all you see is like a canopy of tree, canopy of trees, beautiful trees. Right. And in my spirit, in my soul's ear, I heard she came to see us today. Wow. And mm. I was terrified mm. of telling anybody in the car because I'm sure they would have been like, you know, we're just going to let you out on the side of the highway <laughs> yeah. and you can come back for Florence the best way you can. So yeah, I right. didn't say anything and I left it alone. The day I found out about Willoughby, that's why it was so emotional for me. I just believed that it was just a calling like this is going to mean something to you. It'll come back to you. And it did. Not only that, and I, it's hard for me. I'm really proud of myself because normally when I talk about Willoughby, I cry or I get very, very emotional about her because everything in her segment, every person except for one that was in that segment, I had been to the location before. Francis Marion University was one of them where they have the slave cabins. I had already been there 20 something years ago. The Archive Center in Marion, South Carolina, Maxie Foxworth works there. I had already been there. And let's see, what was the other place? Oh, and then the Slave Mart in Charleston. I had already been there. And then there's a guy, um, I'm sure you know him, uh, Joseph McGill. He does the Slave Dwelling Project. Absolutely. The day, I, the day I found out about Willoughby, the, before I found out about Willoughby, I was talking to him on Facebook Live. He's in that segment. So can you imagine all of this has happened before time and then you find out about your ancestor and then every place that's highlighted that they went to where they're telling her story, you have been there. That's why Willoughby is the most, the, the person, the, the ancestor that sticks with me the most. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Somebody said uh, ancestors is deep. It's no joke. It's, no not, joke. Mm -hmm, it's, yeah. it's, it's mm -hmm. very, very, very spiritual. And if you listen as you're doing the research, things will listen. I my second great grandfather, I had given up. I had looked for him for 24 years. I was like, I'm done. And one day was like, look again, check your DNA matches. I was like, I'm not. Doing, I literally was having a conversation. I am not looking for him mm -hmm. anymore. And it would not leave me. Check again. I checked my DNA matches and there was a guy in New Jersey with the same surname crosses one of my surnames. And I'm going, okay, wait a minute. I don't have any family in New Jersey. And I'm going to tell this and then I'm, I'm done. I'm going to have another question. So I reach out to him and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Who are your grandparents? He looked very young. I was like, I need to forget the parents. I want grandparents. And when he came back and said who his grandfather was, I lost it. And let me tell you why. There's a woman that lived in my town and we were friends for over 30 years. She passed away in 2018. We were so close that she said, oh, Janice, we got to be family. We're so close. And she never stopped saying that. And when I say lived around the corner, I could walk out my door and be at her house in five minutes. The young man that took the DNA test was related to her. In my town, I moved here because this is where my husband went to school. And when we got married, I'm like, OK. And it's a predominantly white community. And then most of the black people, they kind of know each other, grew up together. Every black person in this town I'm related to from that finding out about that DNA test. The woman that lived around the corner from me, she was my cousin. I have a picture of her great-grandfather and my great-grandfather. They were brothers. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is the line that takes me all the way back to 1720 in Rhode Island. Wow. And so I cried. I, I mean, it was a deep cry because I'm like, oh my gosh, Leslie, you were right, right? And listen, I'm driving to work and I'm just like, so like, God, really? Like, she just couldn't be here for this. And I look up and in most cases, you see a rainbow that's like gold over this particular morning. And normally when this happens, it was a circle rainbow with different colors. And again, in my heart of hearts and soul of souls, 
I was like, she knows. Mm -hmm. So you tell me based on what I've shared with you that it's not worth it to do this work. Your research journey may not be like mine, but it is worth it. And I believe that the blood of our ancestors, all of what they went through and all cries out to us. It says, remember me. Hmm. Look for me. Tell my story. I'm you and you are me. Remember me. That's what I want folks to get is that it's worth it to do it. You can do it. The information is there. And when they tell you, oh, 1860, uh, they're just listed by um, color and age. Do you know, and April, this is connected to our family, that there's a line of the chestnut that's listed on the 1860 census record? The, the, the census taker made a mistake and put their names. He listed their names. It's worth it to do the work. And our ancestors are in the historical records. There's the Freedmen's Bureau records. There's the slave narratives. It's worth it to read it. And then Mom Jenny's slave narrative is in the Gullah Geechee dialect. She's speaking. So to really sit and understand what she was talking about, it took me three hours to sit and take my time and read what she was saying. And it's powerful. And that's free. The slave narratives are online for free. So look her up and read hers, but read it real slow. Brother right. Edward, yes. I don't know if um, Ms. Marjorie's watching or, or Dr. Veronica Gerald, but I'm telling you, I'm sure that uh, the three words she just mentioned, Gullah Geechee Dialect, it they probably sat up like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, yeah. Veronica and, and, Gerald is my friend on Facebook, and I'm researching, but I believe that we're family because the Geralds are connected to my family, and... Um, I've seen some of her work. I think she is phenomenal. Isn't this amazing? And, I, you know, when you were talking about um, how pretty much the ancestors are speaking to us from beyond the grave and they're trying to tell us, you know, what we need to know as far as um, the nudge to find out more about our ancestry. Yeah. I also think they're trying to let us know that they have reconnected on the other side. And so we need to find out what's going on or what happened so that, you know, we can have the opportunity to savor and enjoy what we learn about our history, even if it was not, um, you know, there's a mix. Yeah, a mix. because you're gonna you're gonna hit you're gonna learn the bad. You're gonna learn you know the beautiful. And you know I know for me this journey as far as trying to trace my family roots uh, really uh, came to light and really became more of a driving force in in my heart and my spirit after my mother passed in 2019 because you know we always talked about the fact that uh, you know her mother died young so i never knew my grandmother and then after my mom passed uh, my daughter one day called me she said mom i you know had a dream and, and i have been pressed to find out more about mariah you know and so we've heard stories for for years about the person that my mom called mama mariah and so as we're you know we're digging into things and we're finding out things and you know my daughter used some of the same resources that you're speaking of birth records death records all this other stuff you know i said to her you know what i believe that what we're learning is that maybe she has reconnected with mama mariah maybe she's reconnected with her own mother and so now you know she's imploring us to really find out as much as we can on this side so that you know we have that history and we understand and so i also have a cousin uh in the georgetown area and he is pressed to find out more about uh our uh roots out of georgetown and out of the north santee area and just recently we found out that a um great great grandmother of mine is buried on a plantation in georgetown wow. there's there's a proper there's property not even two miles from my grandfather's house and so now our family is you know we're, we're trying to figure out how we can you know not only locate where they're buried but also uh, more about those people and you know that lineage traces back to 1820 and i'm sure that there's some um more that we're going to find out down the line and it's just absolutely amazing it really is well let me just say this um as a person i'm a christian so by you know uh, uh, that's my faith right so 
years ago, if somebody had said, oh, the ancestors speak and all, I'd have been, oh, no, we don't do, no, we're not supposed to. I, that is, I think that sometimes we're taught the wrong, we're just, we're just made to think everything is taboo, everything is taboo. And then I started thinking and I said, you know, Jewish people, they say, oh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, mm -hmm. and some Christians say the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. And I'm like, and the God of Willoughby, the God of Eugenia, the God of, and calling out the names of my ancestors. And they're remembered. So I'm sitting here going, no, I'm going to remember my ancestors too. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a very visual person, right? And so I believe that when we find them in the historical records, when we tell their stories, I'm so visual that I, I can imagine them going, girl, they found me. Did you, did you ask? Did you ask? <laughs> yes. They found me and they're telling my story. Mm -hmm. And I too, yeah. I just, I think we are spirit beings. This does not make me. Right. My personality, my spirit are what makes me. Right. And we're, and the faith is your spirit never dies. The spirit mm -hmm. never not dies. And even in the Bible, it says, God says, I knew you before I formed you. Mm -hmm. you formed, right. Mm -hmm. So there is something different. I think we have to be a little bit careful about people dictating to us, you know, what we're supposed to believe in. You're not supposed to do that because I can tell you, and I'll, I'll end with this. I can tell you there are things that have happened, information that has been revealed, connections that have been made, going to conferences and meeting people and finding out they're related to me, having a conversation about a Facebook post mm -hmm. and finding out that April Garner is related to me. There, that's not coincidence. I don't mm -hmm. think it's coincidence when it comes to genealogy. I believe that it is ordained when we make those connections. I One conference I was in, it was like, go up and talk to that person because you're related to her. I was like, I'm not doing that. Again, come, I am not doing that. Look at all those people that are up there talking to her. All of the people leave. <sighs> okay. Go up and start talking to the person and ask them if they're on this program called GEDmatch, which is a, a software program where no matter what test you've taken, if you upload your DNA, you get more matches. And I said, well, what's your name? She says the name. I was like, I've heard that name before. I come back home and check and the woman is related to me. I've gone to presented at conferences and been called two weeks later. Are you Janice Cross Gilliard on 23andMe? Yes. Why? Your DNA is matching my father's. Meeting people, looking at a scrapbook and this other person is connected to us, April, looking through the scrapbook and going, Vereen, I have Vereen. Oh, you've got, um, I forget, I think the, I think the name actually might have been Mariah. Mariah? Oh, I have a Mariah. I'll call you when I get home. Knew the woman for three years and in the same genealogy group and we're connected. Hmm. It's happened time and time. So many times I can't even begin to tell you that my genealogy group, they love me, but they don't like me when it comes to DNA and connecting because they're like, you're related to everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> everybody. Yeah, wow. it's worth it. The it's job. amazing. It, it. it really is. And, you know, one other thing that I want to um, just mention about how we connected the post that uh, Janice and I connected over was a post that Damien Fordham made about the door of no return. Yes. The door of no return, which is the Cape Coast Castle in Ghana. And so the the he made a post about it. And my reply to it was all about the fact that it's someplace that I've always wanted to visit. And I can just imagine that if you're standing in the doorway and if you're walking through the dungeon, you can probably feel your ancestors. And you can, if you're still, you can probably hear them. And it's just something that's always, you know, resonated in my spirit that that is such a sacred place. And right. so, um, you know, it was that post that, that brought us together. And it's amazing because so many things that you've shared with us, all of the resources and, uh, you know, your findings and uh, the history that you and I have shared just in our personal conversation, connecting us uh, in terms of the the Vereen and the Chestnut line tonight. I, maybe I for, had forgotten, uh, and I'm sure you mentioned it, but knowing that you have connections in, in Mullins and Marion, and I'm actually getting ready to marry into a family out of, out of, the, out of Marion County. I mean, it's amazing, uh, you know, and it's, it's also the reason why we need to understand our family history. We need to understand our connections to make sure that you know uh, these lines are not crossing in, in oh they're real cross <laughs> and they're like, look, hey, you, you forget about cross. that and they can't <laughs> cross you, you, know, about that. you might as well let love take its course and that's it that's true Mary that's true Mary Mary County, County, the majority of the families 
the majority of the families in Marion County, they are connected in some way way mm. so on this facebook page that i have i'll see oh congratulate you'll see congratulations i'm like cousin cousin cousin, <laughs> cousin. and it's distant but we, a lot of people a lot of the communities we stop asking that question when you would go and visit what was the question of who are your people who are your people who are your people that's right you know that's before the before the broadcast before we began the broadcast we were kind of talking pep talk and uh, and the three of us and um you, you also mentioned that the two names you, you call that um, was Chestnut. Yes. One was Chestnut. And, and, and you also mentioned McQueen. Yes. Because I, I believe that we're connected and it's going to be, and I'm almost, I'm like 100%. It's going to be through the Bellamy line, the Parkers, uh, Phillips, Cox, and Ward. And some of that line is it's African and it's also Native American. I just found uh, the native side recently. So, and it's Cherokee. And I, and the reason that I was wondering about it was because there were some of our line that left North Carolina and they went to Oklahoma and they're buried in the Cherokee cemetery. Mm. And I just kept trying to dismiss it. I'm like, but well, wait a minute, this is specifically a Cherokee cemetery. Why are they buried there? And in doing the research discovered they were going back home. So we've got Oklahoma connections as well. Wow, wow. And so, the DeWitt says Bellamy's with a bunch of question marks, brother. Listen, Edna, well, DeWitt, DeWitt, <laughs> listen, I don't know if you know Edna, but Edna, reach out to me because DeWitt is mixed in there with the uh, the Bellamy's, the Cox, the Wards. We're all, so DeWitt is, she's probably a cousin. Edna's probably a cousin. Hmm. Okay, you know, hmm. and, and, uh, we have these conversations. It does. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're uh, not just about to run out of time, but uh, you, uh, let me revert to the name uh, Chestnut. Uh, just want to let you and, and the, the public know that um, uh, there's a Reverend Lonnie Chestnut that's in uh, Conway, South Carolina, and he's well known, okay, because he's 94 years old. Wow. That's and him on the screen. That's Uncle Lonnie. Lonnie. That's Uncle Lonnie, Janice. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Can't wait to meet him. He's still living? Yes. yes. He's 94. Mm hmm. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a, a proper way of, of getting the, uh, the the video that we just took of him, which was last uh, th Friday, I believe, of him. And we, uh, I wanted to just show a little clip of him, but he was given a good narrative or background of how he entered uh, uh, Ory County, where he was born, you know, some 90 some years ago, and how he got to, be, to end up in Conway. And he's been around because he's uh, been the pastor of a number of churches and also taught at some of the major uh, high schools. Wow. Okay. So he's an uh, educator. He's a right. um, a veteran. He served in more than one military branch. He's a World War II veteran. Mm -hmm. Has anyone interviewed him? Yes. We, no, I, 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 I don't. I don't know. I've talked to his daughter Cassandra about you know her interviews with him, and I think she's captured some things. But you know, to really know what questions to ask, to really. You know, oh, get, that's you important. need to have a conversation. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to connect. Next, next, on, on, our, on our next broadcast, uh, because we went through the whole gambit of that, uh, we had about five questions. And uh, on the next broadcast, uh, you will see um, what the interview that we had okay, wow. of, of him. Uh, I guess it lasts about 15, 20 minutes. But it was, okay. it was, it was taped. And uh, we, it, there were some canned questions. Uh, they were had for him, and, and he did a, a, a quite an extensive narrative on, almost on each one. So, wow. um, okay, so we, uh, maybe Thank next you. maybe next week, Thank if I get with April, I can I can uh, get this amount of data over to her because it's a Thank lot of data. You. I mean, she's probably yeah, his daughter's probably watching tonight, so I'll yeah. be sure that we connect. Yeah, with Cassandra. Yeah, with Cassandra. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, but next yeah. broadcast, hopefully, we can have a, have at least a portion of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you've answered a couple of the questions that came through, and I know you saw the comments that were coming in tonight. We just want to thank everyone for watching tonight. Uh, Larry McCray uh, came in just a few minutes ago, and he asked about the uh, Ancestry DNA test. And, and I know that there's you know lots of DNA tests out there. I've taken the 23andMe, uh, but um, I believe you said that you have taken the 23andMe as well? I re I've taken both. Okay. But I recommend... Ancestry.com because more people have their family trees and you can make connections. 23andMe is a little more challenging for that. And they it know is. that so they mm -hmm. actually allow you to link your Ancestry.com in your profile 
on 23andMe. But I highly recommend, no shade, 23andMe, but I recommend Ancestry.com. And use the tool that they have. It's called Through Lines, where you can link your family tree to your DNA, and it will tell you, as long as other people have done the same thing, it will tell you how you're related to people. That so is amazing. I'm doing that. Yes, that's happening. I'm getting ready to, <laughs> I'm going to do that. That's going to be my next project. So, uh, Janice, I just want to go over, um, you know, the four major points that you want people to understand about discovering their roots. And it's research, document as you go, share it and preserve it. Yes, yes. absolutely. And start. The first one is start. That's start. Right. Yeah, start. Mm -hmm. Start. <laughs> start. Get started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I tell you, cousin, this has been wonderful. I, I couldn't have imagined it being any better tonight. And I know that there's so much more that you can share with us. And it's just great absolutely. to connect with you. And I hope we le get to learn more about each other and I get to introduce you to others. But um, it has certainly been a pleasure having you here tonight. And I definitely want people to uh, understand that you can be uh, contacted and uh, you have a website. As a matter of fact, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about your um, your work. So you can go to JCD, say JCG, excuse me, dash genealogy collective.com. And I have all of my information there as well as a link for my podcast, um, media interviews I've done, workshops that I've done. Everything is there. So you're more than welcome to reach out to me. And you can also link to my Facebook page as well. And the podcast is every Thursday at 8 p.m. And to April and Mr. McQueen as well, thank you so much. I am humbled and honored to share. And this has just been a blessing for me as well. Well, likewise, well, I have a lot of humility towards that myself. <laughs> you generated that. Thank you. Yeah, this was lovely. It really was. And we just want to thank everyone for uh, watching tonight, for joining us. And uh, uh, one more question from Edna Bellamy. She says, what about my heritage? My heritage is really, really good, but I'm partial to Ancestry.com. Um, most people are on Ancestry.com. My heritage, they have a lot of uh, DNA tools that are really, really good. So I do recommend them, but most people are on Ancestry.com. You can upload your Ancestry and I believe 23andMe DNA up to My Heritage, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. So all of them have something to offer, but I'm just partial. Partial to that, partial. yeah. But yeah. I wish you all the best. I wish all of the participants the best in your research. It can be done. And feel free to reach out to me. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Brother Edward. Uh, we want to tell our audience who we have with us next week. Yes. Indeed. Okay. Yes, we have uh, Miss Elfrida Funny. Uh, she wants to highlight on some, some and a very important uh, topic, and that is uh, mental health. I believe, and uh, it, it's going to be a lot of revelations there that um, uh, since it's been talked about for a, a couple of years ago, I think we talked some about it, but ever so often, I think we, we touched base on that, uh, the mental health, but that's an issue that's, that's an ongoing issue that uh, needs to stay in the focus. Okay, so uh, she's going to uh, be on with us, um, and she may have a, a, a uh, someone to accompany her to and maybe an expert in the field uh, to talk about that but it should be exciting. And Alfreda is with, uh, what organization is she with well, now? She is with Goodwill now. She, that's her em employer and it's Goodwill. Now the, the organization uh, that's dealing with the um, mental health, uh, I'm not sure about it. Uh, the name was on my tongue, but if it could, it could be, I could be giving you a, a, a subtitle of it instead of the actual title. So I, okay. I'll just leave it like that. Okay, all right. Just and then- correct. Okay, no problem. And then to round out uh, February and Black History Month, we have Shane O'Reilly, who will be joining us on February 28th. And we're going to talk about bone marrow matching and why it's important for the African-American yes. community. Absolutely. Uh, this is a, a huge topic. And uh, Shana has a very personal story that's connected to it. And she's doing some advocacy work now to make sure that African Americans understand that this is a life source for us, and uh, we need to understand more about why it's so important to, to understand the power of bone marrow and uh, the process of matching in order to save lives in our community. So that's going to happen on February the 28th, 
And if you have a, a great topic that you would like for us to cover or some you know critical issue you would like for us to explore, please let us know. You yeah, can hit me up absolutely. on Facebook, uh, on our World Community Magazine page. You can also connect with us through the WCMMagazine.net website. Just send us a message and uh, we'll be sure to research it and see what we can do. Uh, Brother Edward, it has been a pleasure tonight. Cousin Janice, good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you, yes. and Edward, nice to meet you as well. This has been, been a pleasure. It's thank you. Pleasure. Yes, and thank really you to all you. to all who have viewed tonight. We really do appreciate it. Spread the word. Uh, yeah. You know, let everyone know that we're here every Tuesday night at seven p.m. Yeah. And we will. Yes, we'll see you next week. So everybody, have a good night. Uh, check out safe. check out the website for the the new edition of the magazine. Yes, okay. yes. the new uh, magazine is up. Mm -hmm. Magazine up. Check out www.wcmagazine.net. All right. Video. Get the entire magazine. See you next week. All right. Take care, everyone. God bless and good night. <laughs> Thank you for watching the World Community Magazine's Hour of Power Live on Facebook with your host, Edward McQueen and April Garner.